Well, welcome. We are certainly, again, glad that you are here, glad that you've chosen to worship with us today. We are in week two of a brand new sermon series called Pressure Points. It is a series that's going to take us through the book of James in the New Testament, and we are going to find in James's writing, I, I believe, some wonderful truth for the world and the time in which we live. And we began last week by just acknowledging the fact that we live in a world that is filled with and governed by pressure of all different kinds. I reminded you that if you drove here to worship and you did not have air pressure in your tires, you would have had a hard time driving here. And if you did not have very good blood pressure, you would have a hard time being in this place today as well. The very things of our lives, we are governed and filled with pressure. And one of the things that I reminded you of last week out of James chapter 1 is that pressure comes in life. If you are alive, you are going to experience pressure. James does not say if you encounter trials and temptations. He says when you encounter trials and temptations. Like it or not, pressure will come in your life and will come in mine. It may not be today, but as sure as I am standing here today, you will know pressure at one point in time. So the question then is... What are we going to do with that pressure? And we need to remember that when pressure comes, it will never reveal what is already inside of us. I'm sorry, it will never put anything into us. It will only reveal what is inside of us. Okay, if it's not already there, when pressure comes, it's not going to just magically appear. But through pressure, God can cause us to grow and be transformed. And today we're going to talk about a different kind of pressure. Last week we talked about pressure in general. Today we're going to talk very specifically about the pressure that comes in our life that actually prompts us to act. And typically we act in one of two ways. We speak or we do things. So when the pressure comes in your life that wants to push you into speaking and acting, how are you going to face that kind of pressure? Well, I believe James has a word for us today. I believe he's got great insight for us about how to face that kind of pressure. Unfortunately, too many times in our lives, whether it's in church or just life in general, the tyranny of that urgent feel that we have when pressure comes causes us to act often before we should. It pulls us to action that is often unproductive, or at least not as productive as we hope it would be. The weight of the pressure comes in our life and we think to ourselves, we must do something. And so we run into those things many times before we should. And we see that played out in the public sphere all around us. We see it in the political world. We see it just in the lives of people. Every crisis prompts an immediate action or set of talking points. We're not going to think through it. We're just going to immediately respond. We're going to immediately do something out of the pressure of the moment. Unfortunately, social media has also made this exceptionally challenging. Many even well-meaning Christians have allowed social media to become an immediate outlet for response that is often not very helpful and often not Christ-honoring. So, we're going to turn to the book of James and look to his specific word about the pressure to act. And how do we, how do we respond to that? Do we act now or are there things that we can learn? So, if you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of James. It is in the New Testament. Towards the tail end, it's about the last, uh, you know, quarter inch of your Bible, perhaps, depending on the Bible that you may, may have brought with you. And as you're turning to the book of James, I just want to remind you that the bottom line of today is this. The pressure to act, according to James, is best governed by listening, then doing. The pressure to act is best governed by listening, then doing. So James chapter 1, we're going to pick up the text in chapter or in verse 19. Now James has just unpacked in the previous four or five verses a number of truths about our relationship in in the Lord and and how temptation works in our life and where it comes from and how we find victory over it. So he begins verse 19 by saying, but this you know, my brethren. Okay, so everything that he's just said in the previous verses, he says, you already know that. And then he begins in the second half of verse 19 with these words. But everyone must be quick to hear slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, pay attention when you hear that word therefore, because there's some good truth that follows after. Therefore, put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness 
In humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourself to be doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. And once he's looked at himself and gone away, he immediately has forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, a forgetful hearer, not a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet doesn't bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress, to keep oneself unstained from the world. I believe James has a word to us today about the response that we are called to when pressure comes. So before we listen, or before we act, James says, first and foremost, we need to be a people who listen. In fact, he uses the language to be swift to listen and slow to speak. And here's a bit of a contrast. So if he says you're going to be swift to listen, that also implies slow to speak. Listening needs to become your first priority. I'm sure some of you in this room have heard things like the old saying, haste makes waste, or maybe you've told your children, think before you speak. It's exactly what James is talking about here. How many times have you and I allowed the pressure of the moment to cause us to speak unwisely? So James says, be swift to listen, be quick to listen. Those words mean to be speedy, to be prompt, to be ready to listen. So if you're looking at verse 19, that's the language that, that James is using here. We need to be speedy. We need to run first to listening. We need to be prompt to listen. And not just kind of be listening a little bit. He actually says be ready to listen. That means give it your full attention. In the heat of the moment, have we said things we should not? Have we opened our mouth and instead inserted our foot? When that happens, it's because we have not been quick to listen and slow to speak. We've been quick to speak and slow to listen. James calls us to a different way of living. I remind you that words are often like toothpaste, that once the toothpaste is out of the tube, it's pretty doggone hard to put it back in the tube, isn't it? Once the words have come out of your mouth, brothers and sisters, you can't take them back very well. Out in cyberspace, there are a lot of folks that think, well, gee, if I tweeted something, if I texted something, It's gone. No, unfortunately, that stuff stays out in cyberspace. So when you make a post on Facebook or in some other social media realm, it's there in perpetuity. People are going to find those things if they search for them. Guard the words that you say. Be swift to listen and slow to speak. Sometimes what happens is that we respond with some passion. And James isn't saying that there is not room for passionate response. Here's a little picture of a, of a character from an animated movie in recent years called Inside Out. And they took the human emotions and they illustrated them with little cartoon characters. How many know what this cartoon character is? It's anger. Okay, Anger is a passionate Response and anger can be a very powerful motivator and a potentially healthy response to pressure. God gave us emotions. He's not saying you should not ever have anger in your life. It's an important emotion. Sometimes we actually need a touch of righteous anger in our lives. Look at Jesus. In a moment of passionate response, in righteous anger, he turns over the tables in the temple and he casts out the money changers. Anger is a very positive thing when it's under God's control. Our problem, the danger that we experience, is when passion outpaces wisdom or thoughtful response. The danger comes when passion outpaces wisdom or a thoughtful response. So here is some pressure points math for you. Maybe you're not a real big fan of math in general, but here's a, here's a math equation. Pressure plus anger plus a hasty spirit or action will always end up with problems. It will always equal problems. If you are not swift to listen and slow to speak, 
the pressure that will come in your life, coupled with a passionate response of anger and a quick action will eventually lead you to problems. You will do something or you will say something that will not be honoring to God and may actually be very, very hurtful and destructive to the relationship or circumstance that you find yourself in. Unchecked anger. Unchecked anger is never productive. Look what James says in verse number 20. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Not anger in general, but the anger of man, meaning that the anger that is unchecked, out of control, not under God's lordship or his spirit's guiding and prompting, will always lead to an unproductive result. Brothers and sisters in the faith, be quick to listen, be slow to speak, and be slow to become angry. So what are some of the signs and symptoms that we have been pressured into acting rather than listening? Well, last week we talked about trials and temptations that come into our lives. One of the ways that we are not quick to listen or slow to speak and slow to get angry is that we don't really listen when those trials and temptations come. James said at the beginning of chapter 1 that those temptations come and God will use them to sharpen and grow our faith. But if we never take the time to really listen in the moment of pressure that comes, we will miss out on the opportunity for growth. And then we will rail against God about the pressures that come rather than saying, God, what can I learn from this? How can I grow? Sometimes one of the ways that we see sign or a symptom that we are not swift to listen and slow to speak is that while someone is talking to us, we're actually not really listening. What we are doing in our mind is we're formulating the response that we're going to give to them. Many times that happens in conjunction with anger. Somebody comes and confronts us with, that, with something, and so rather than hearing their word perhaps of correction, we're already thinking of how we're going to respond to them. I do that, unfortunately, many times with my wife. Not out of anger, but me, like probably some of you in this room, I'm a fixer. And so when Wendy wants to share a difficulty with me, rather than really listening to her point of view, I am formulating my response. I'm thinking, all right, what three things would I suggest to her to fix the problem? And I'm not really listening. I have not been swift to listen, slow to speak. It's a symptom that we have to be real about. Sometimes when we're listening, we're not really listening to the root issue. We're only listening to the surface problem. And so the response that we have may not be super helpful because we've not discovered what is the root issue of a problem that we're facing. Will we be swift to listen? Sometimes, again, coupled with anger, we are listening, and the whole time that we are listening, this is what we're thinking about. I'm going to deny any accusation that this person brings to me. So I'm already thinking about what can I deny? Second thing we might do is we might be thinking, well, how can I defend this? Even if it's wrong, how can I defend this? Because I'm going to save face in this argument. The pressure has come in the midst of a, a circumstance, and I'm going to defend my position even if it's wrong. That's what we're thinking about. Sometimes in that pressure point, what we do is we actually enhance our position. So we'll tell the story much bigger. Well, it's like fishermen. You know, how, well, how big are the fish? Well, I actually only caught a fish this big, but when I tell the story, the fish is this big. I've enhanced my position. I've enhanced my accomplishment. So sometimes when the pressure comes, rather than just telling the truth, we'll expand on it to make it seem like we knew a whole lot more. That happened very famously uh, with uh, one who was serving in politics and told a story of landing a plane in a conflict kind of area, and that plane landed just fine. But later on, when the story was told to the media, that plane was under all kinds of enemy fire. There were bullets flying everywhere, and they barely made it out with their lives. They enhanced their position. In the pressure of the moment, rather than just speaking truth, they enhanced their position. And that happens when we are not swift to listen and slow to speak. Why is this important? Why is listening the first thing that James says we are supposed to do? I love what Dietrich Bonhoeffer says in this quote. Bonhoeffer says this, Christians who no longer listen to one another will soon no longer listen to God either. James is giving us some very practical wisdom about life in general. But the danger is if we can't listen to one another, more than likely we're not going to be listening to God. 
be swift to listen, slow to speak. So then what instruction does James give to us? So take your text again, pick it up in verse number 21, and we'll read for just a few verses here. James says, Therefore put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility. Receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. So the first thing that we must do is we must humble ourselves before the word of God. If we're going to be people who understand how to balance this listening and speaking, this pressure to act, one of the most important things that we can do is we can humble ourselves under the Word of God. And what does that mean? To humble yourself before the Word of God is to acknowledge that God's Word has truth and power that you and I need. In Hebrews, the fourth chapter, a verse that's probably very familiar to most of us in this room, the Hebrew writer says that the Word of God is like a double-edged sword. And it's able to pierce us to the very center of our being. All of our motives, all of our actions are going to be laid bare before the Word of God. If we're going to humble ourselves before the Word of God, we have to acknowledge its power. We have to hear its truth and its correction in our lives. We have to be willing to admit our faults. And I'm not just preaching that to you. I am preaching this text to me. I must be willing and you must be willing to humble ourselves before the Word of God. And James puts some qualifiers in this. He says that we're to put aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. And what James is saying is when you come before the Word of God, you must be willing to lay aside everything that is within you that will negatively impact your response to pressure. What are the things that lie in my heart? What are the things that lie in your heart? Attitudes, actions, unchecked emotions that actually cause you to respond inappropriately when the pressure comes. James says you must and I must lay those things aside. The language that James uses there of filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, he, he's talking about the things that morally defy us. He is talking about some of the most uh, base desires that exist in the human mind, but he is also talking about the ill will or desire to injure people. Many times when we are not swift to listen and slow to speak, we say things that are the most injurious to other people. James says that's the kind of stuff that you need to lay aside and I need to lay aside if we're going to humble ourselves before the Word of God. The Word's a very powerful thing. It's like a mirror, and here's a picture of a man looking at a mirror. The mirror of the Word of God does not coddle or flatter The mirror of God's word will always show our spots and wrinkles. If we will humble ourselves before the word of God, God will never sugarcoat who I am or who you are. He will never wink at our bad attitudes. He will never wink at our poor action and response to pressure. God will always, always, always call us out. His word will do that. In that passage in Hebrews In that fourth chapter, it goes on to say that everything about us will be exposed before our Creator. God's Word will expose everything that is not like Him. And so we must submit ourselves to the transforming Word of God. Jesus, in His high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, prays for His disciples and He prays to God and says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your Word is truth. When we bring ourselves humbly before the Word of God, God desires to sanctify us, make us pure, make us holy, but that will only come when we humble ourselves before Him. Another passage of Scripture that you're probably very, very well familiar with, go to 2 Timothy. So just back up a couple books in the New Testament, back to your left in the book. 2 Timothy in the third chapter, we hear Paul writing to Timothy, and uh, he says these words, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so the man of God may be equipped adequately for every good work. That's verses 16 and 17 out of chapter 3. God's Word is intended to mold us and shape us after His will, but we must come humbly before His Word for that shaping to take place. And James says it's not just enough to listen to God's Word. So again, pick our text back up. We're going to pick it up in uh, James, and we're going to pick it up right in verse number 22. 
James says, but prove yourself doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves or deceive themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately has forgotten what kind of person he is. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. So not only do we have to humble ourselves before God's word, we have to hear it, but we also have to do it. Hear and apply the word is what James is calling us to. Yes, there is a time for action. Hearing does come first, but merely listening is not enough. Sadly, I know an awful lot of believers that spend a lot of time meditating on God's Word and very little time in obedience to God's Word. Both are absolutely necessary. We must meditate on God's Word and we must obey it. You can memorize the entirety of the Bible and quote it back to me here in this worship service. But if you never take the time to apply any of that word, all of your memorization is for naught. It will be of no value to you. I have shared with you in past, I believe it was Nikita Khrushchev, a former leader of the Soviet Union. And as a child, his parents taught him to memorize large quantities of Scripture, like the entirety of a, of a gospel. And they used to take him around like a sideshow kind of thing, and he would spout the word of God to people. He would recite the entirety of a gospel. And it had no effect on him because he chose not to obey it. And he became a dictator in Russia. You can come to Sunday school all of your life. You can never miss a worship service for years and years and years. But if you never obey God's word, it does not matter. We must hear and obey. James says, without the word, you actually forget who you are. It's this mirror of ourselves. Again, here's a mirror image for us. The Word actually acts like an anchor for your identity and your action. James says in the tail end of that passage, he says that when you go away from the mirror, you actually forget the kind of person you actually are. Without the mirror of God's Word, without obeying it as well as hearing it, you have no anchor. You have nothing to guide and to direct your life. Jesus says the very same thing. Of course, James is Jesus' brother. So it's quite possible that James says these words because he remembered the teaching of Jesus. When Jesus says there are two kinds of builders, there's a wise builder and there's a foolish builder. The wise builder builds a house that's built on a foundation that's solid. The, The foolish builder builds on sand. And how does he distinguish the two foundations? It's the person who not only hears the Word of God, but does the Word of God that is built wisely on a solid foundation. If we do not hear and obey, we are merely deceiving ourselves, James says. He actually says it twice in this passage of Scripture, that you deceive yourself. We must hear and obey. There are an awful lot of voices that we can listen to. One of the worst voices sometimes that we listen to is our own voice, and we need to listen to God's voice. And that comes when we not only hear his word, but we obey it. Paul, when he wrote to the church at Rome, says, Are you being conformed by the world? Are you being transformed in the renewing of your mind? How do we become renewed in our mind? We become renewed in our mind by hearing the word of God, but also applying it to our lives by being obedient to it, that we become transformed into his image Why is this important? The proverb writer says, well, there's a way that seems right to man, but it leads to destruction. James says it this way in verse 25, the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, what's the result? This man will be blessed in what he does. Why is hearing the word and applying it important? Because we, if we want to live a life that is pleasing to God, if we want to live a life that has some good results to it, then we must hear and apply. Again, I turn to the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he says this, if we have learned to be silent before the word, we will also learn to manage our silence and our speech during the day. We should listen with the ears of God that we may speak the words of God. If we want to conduct ourselves in the midst of pressure and submit yourself to the word of God, hear it and apply it, and out of that life-giving transformation that the word will bring, then we will be able to speak well 
in the day and time in which we live. Hear and apply. One last word of instruction that James gives to us. It's couched a little bit um, more veiled perhaps than others. But James says is that we need to allow the word of God to rearrange our priorities. Action is not enough. Right action is what God calls his people to. Okay? In the pressure that comes in our life, action is not enough. Right action is what God calls us to. So look at verse 26 and 27 in the text today. James says, if anyone thinks himself to be religious, meaning if anybody thinks he's doing what God wants him to do, and yet he doesn't bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God our Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress, keep oneself unstained by the world. See, God's word should lead us to right action, not just action, not just good religious stuff. There is a right action God calls us to. So the word informs and guides us in life. The word should inform and guide us in life in general. In Proverbs, the writer of Proverbs says this, like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word that is fitly or rightly spoken. It's not enough just to speak a word. But when that word is rightly or fitly spoken, when it's been guided by the word of God, it will be like apples of gold and settings of silver, something of highest value and greatest worth to other people. We have to have right action. He also says this in Proverbs chapter 15. Similar words. Proverbs 15, he says, A man has joy in an apt or appropriate or right answer. How delightful is a timely word. How do we have and speak timely words? We need to allow God and His Word and by His Spirit to direct our speech. And in just a few weeks as we journey farther into James, we're actually going to dig into what James has to say to us very specifically about our tongue. But will we allow the actions of our life when pressure comes to be informed and guided by God's Word? And not only in life in general, but I believe that God calls us to have the actions in our ministry life as a church to be guided and informed by the Word of God. And that's part of what James says. You can go through an awful lot of religious activity, but if your religious activity doesn't reflect the heart of God, which is to care for people who are broken, who are hurting, who are in need, then all of your religious activity is absolutely meaningless and worthless. The kind of right action that God calls the church to in ministry is the kind that must reflect the heart of God. And so we as a church, we as leaders, have to ask ourselves, how much does our ministry reflect the heart of God? And the only way that we will know the answer to that is if we listen before we do. If we merely just plan ministry ventures and never ask God if this is where we should go or this is what we should do, then most likely we will be outside of His will. Listening helps us perceive the root issues that need to be addressed. Listening to God will give us the best course of action. I've said it to you before. I'll say it to you again. You'll probably hear me say it during uh, my years of ministry here. We must always guard against planning first and inviting God to join us rather than listening for what God is doing and where he is directing and join him in that venture. God's word must guide us in life and he must guide us in ministry. So some questions for you as I close today. What are some current experiences that you are facing right now that are pressuring you to act? What are some current experiences that are pressuring you to act and perhaps act in haste? Recognizing those current experiences, how much are you listening to God and to His Word? How much time are you spending in God's Word and allowing it to direct the course of your action? How much time have you given to God's Word? If you haven't cracked open the Bible since the last time we met together on a Sunday morning, you're not positioning yourself well to respond to the pressure that comes in life. We must be a people of God's Word. How is God's Word then impacting your thoughts and then also your actions? 
So you tell me that you spent a lot of time in God's Word this week. Wonderful. Tell me how that Word that you have been reading is impacting your actions, your thoughts, your speech. Because James says unless we humble ourselves before the Word, that we're going to find ourselves not acting rightly. We'll act in a way that is displeasing to God. So here's my challenge for you. Two verses of Scripture. Psalm 119.11. The psalmist says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. How do we humble ourselves before God's word? We need to make sure that we are in it. How can we make sure that we live a life that is filled with right action and the pressure that comes in our lives? We must hide God's word in our heart so that we can walk faithfully before him. I encourage you to memorize Psalm 119, verse 11. And then I also encourage you to memorize the passage from Proverbs that I shared with you. Like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. Two verses I'm going to challenge you this week to memorize. I also want you to do this. Sticky note, three by five card, whatever you want to write. Write those two verses. Write them out, not just their reference. Write the whole verse out on a card or a piece of paper. Then I want you to post them someplace in your home. If you have a workspace that you call your own at work, I want you to post those scriptures in your workspace. And if you drive a car, I want you to put that 3 by 5 card or sticky note somewhere in your car. Wendy is often, just because she's very, very conscious about trying to drink the appropriate amounts of water during the day, there have been times in Wendy's faith journey that she's written that scripture verse on a 3 by 5 card and stuck it inside the cupboard door where the glasses are so that every time she opens up and gets a glass of water, there's that verse that she wants to make sure that she's applying to her lives. Wherever is a prominent place in your life, post those two verses and ask God to help you respond to pressure in light of the truth of his word. So that's my challenge to you today. It's my challenge to us as a church moving forward that we would be a people who are swift to listen, slow to speak, slow to be angry, a people who hold ourselves before God's word and allow it to shape us for right response in the midst of pressure. Father, take your word today. I pray that you would apply it to our lives. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to grow so that when the pressure to act comes in our life, and it surely will, It will be a pressure to action. It will be a pressure to speech. It will be a pressure to do, Lord. May those actions be guided and directed by your word. And Father, where we have perhaps been inattentive to your word, Lord, would you give us a fresh desire today and the days ahead to hold ourselves before the mirror of your word that you might search our hearts and transform us more into your image rooted and grounded in who we are in Christ, not in our flesh. So God, would you just be glorified today, I pray. And as we sing, Lord, may we even now begin to respond to you. Just ask these things, Lord, in your name. Amen.